thank you, Tony, uh, Beth, and Bob for uh, inviting me to this uh, really exciting meeting. It's uh, it's uh, really unique uh, to come to a meeting so primate centric. Uh, it's <laughs> a real joy. Uh, so I'll be uh, talking about. Um, work that uh, has led to human work in our lab, but uh, began as uh, monkey work, which I've done most of my career. Uh, in the last 15 years, we've been uh, transitioning to kind of a combination of uh, human and monkey research. And they both <coughs> greatly uh, facilitate one another. Now, in this talk, uh, I'll first describe monkey research on encoding intention in the posterior parietal cortex. I'll then uh, um, uh, discuss applying knowledge gained from this research uh, to develop a neural prosthetic system to help humans with paralysis. Um, then we'll discuss a theory of how uh, cortical neurons can encode information derived both from monkey and human research. Uh, and this is referred to as partially mixed selectivity. Uh, then, uh, finally, I'll discuss uh, efforts we're making toward bidirectional neural interfaces, writing in somatosensory percepts by electrical microstimulation of the primary uh, somatosensory cortex. And also, uh, since we can record from uh, primary sensory cortex, um, decoding uh, um, somatic sensation uh, there and in the posterior parietal cortex. So uh, the posterior parietal cortex is uh, located between motor structures and sensory structures, and uh, it forms a bridge uh, for sensory motor integration. And so it's an interesting place to uh, retrieve a variety of signals that are both sensory related and movement related. This particular example shows visual motor in transformation, uh, vision being uh, the sensory signal on the slide. When you record within the posterior parietal cortex, you often see persistent activity when an animal uses that stimulus to plan a movement. So this is an example recording from a single neuron on one trial. A target is briefly flashed. Uh, this increases activity, and the animal plans a movement, uh, which is sustained now without any sensory stimulus there, uh, and then a cessation of activity after the movement is made. Uh, now, in the course of our uh, studies early on, we found that this um, planning-related activity was effector-specific. So within uh, area LIP that we originally described on its uh, anatomical connections, uh, primarily with other eye movement regions, uh, it's... Uh, it shows more activity during the planning stage for planning saccades than for planning reaches. And uh, another area we found that we refer to as the parietal reach region uh, showed the reverse, uh, not much activity during planning of eye movements, but uh, strong activity during planning of reach movements. Saccada and colleagues uh, published uh, also studies that showed uh, another area, the anterior intraparietal region, which is uh, nearby, uh, codes the uh, shape of grasp. So this is an example of a single cell that responds best uh, to a particular configuration of the hand uh, for a particular object. So with that, uh, Chris Bonio and I, in a review, propose that there is a map of intentions within the posterior parietal cortex. So uh, you have an area that's important for eye movement intentions, one for reaching, and another for grasping. And so uh, given that uh, data, which uh, took a lot of years to collect, uh, we thought 
this might be an interesting place to try an application of neural prosthetics. And the idea there is to decode the intent of the subject and use that uh, to control external devices. So, uh, whoops. So the, uh, the signals would be recorded, uh, uh, interpreted, and used then as control signals. And uh, we, as well as other neuroprosthetic groups working, uh, Andrew will uh, be showing similar uh, recordings. General, uh, we use the uh, Utah probe now uh, manufactured by BlackRock, which is uh, FDA approved. And what I want to point out here is that it's extremely small. So it's four by four millimeters and uh, contains 196 active electrodes. And yet you'll see that even from a very uh, small implant array in the posterior parietal cortex, we can uh, decode a vast number of variables. Uh, so this is a uh, implant that we made about six weeks ago in a uh, human. Uh, and uh, it shows recordings coming from one implant was made in M1 and one in posterior parietal cortex. Uh, this is a particularly good implant, but you can see that essentially all of the channels uh, have at least one neuron on them. Uh, some uh, have two or three. And in our experience, uh, and it's a very small N, but uh, these implants last in humans about five years. Now, uh, to have supportive data for uh, coming to the FDA to want to implant posterior parietal cortex, of course, we needed to have uh, animal data. So we <clears throat> trained otherwise healthy monkeys that had these arrays implanted uh, and had them do brain control. So what you'll see here is a monkey that's doing a um, match to sample of faces, and he's brain controlling the uh, cursor there. So he's just sitting in his chair, uh, and uh, he's matching the face he sees in the center, uh, then moving the cursor out to the match to get a drop of juice reward. Uh, so you can see he's very good at this. He's had a lot of practice. Uh, but uh, this is a demonstration in animals that this technology would work with recordings from posterior parietal cortex. So, and Mickey did a, a, a great, a really wonderful job of reviewing uh, all of the potential uh, applications clinically for uh, this kind of technology. Uh, just briefly to reiter reiterate, uh, it can be important for spinal cord injuries, uh, for stroke, multiple sclerosis, uh, ALS, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is another possibility. Uh, in our case, where uh, our subjects have high level, uh, complete uh, spinal cord transections, and these injuries occur at uh, uh, cervical le levels three and four, or five and six. So as a result, they're tetraplegic, uh, usually they can move their head and their, uh, to some degree, their shoulders. So uh, these are the uh, uh, criteria that we use for uh, selecting our subjects. Now, our first subject was Eric uh, Sorto. He uh, received the uh, gunshot wound through the neck. Uh, he'd been uh, paralyzed for 10 years before he entered our study. And um, to implant the posterior parietal cortex, it's uh, a, um, and, uh, similar to David Van Essen's talk about the folds in the cortex. Uh, if you're going for motor or a somatosensory cortex, you can usually use anatomical landmarks. Uh, but then once you get into the posterior parietal cortex, each person as a, it's like fingerprints, a different folding pattern, and it can even exist differently on the two sides of the brain. So what we would do is ask, uh, in this case, Eric, uh, during functional magnetic resonance imaging to imagine grasping. Uh, so this 
uh, activates a presumed homolog of AIP and to imagine uh, reaching. In this case, uh, since the Utah array electrodes are short, <clears throat> we went for another reach area, which is uh, Brodmann's area five, which is up on the surface. And uh, so this shows, uh, we hope that decoding intention uh, would be uh, very intuitive for the subject. Uh, and uh, this is just a demonstration of that. Uh, Eric will be talking to the uh, occupational therapist while pointing the robotic limb uh, at the uh, So you can see that he can uh, do this uh, very easily, uh, much like uh, what I'm talking here and making gestures. I'm uh, really not aware of it. It doesn't uh, increase the cognitive flow. And uh, sure enough, we found that uh, cells were active to hand shapes. Uh, Eric often played uh, rock, paper, scissors. And here is a cell that's uh, responsive more to rock. Uh, he, here he's just imagining the shape. Uh, here to paper and here to scissors. So uh, it shows these selectivities. Now, I should mention that one advantage of monkey research is after a few thousand trials, Eric will no longer play this game. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so you, you really have to be inventive and after a while make the uh, experiments uh, uh, entertaining uh, as well as scientific. Uh, this is uh, Nancy Smith. Uh, she uh, had a high-level uh, C3, C4 uh, complete spinal cord lesion six years earlier in a car accident. And uh, she has, um, as then when, when, after we saw it in her, we went back to Eric and found a similar result, uh, really uh, fine individual digit control. So uh, in this case, she's uh, controlling a robotic hand. You see that uh, little light indicates which finger to move. And in a minute, uh, Tyson will ask her to move a different finger than the one with. So do your pinky on this next one. No, no, keep going. Uh, so as we uh, progress through this research, and uh, each, each one of these topics would uh, take a, sort of a talk to go through in detail, but we found, uh, originally we hoped to find cells that were tuned. Uh, what we found were cells tuned to many, many things. Uh, it was really uh, an eye-opener, so we uh, found cells coding the goal for a movement, which we knew from the monkey work, and trajectory of the movement, which we also knew uh, from monkey work. Uh, <clears throat> we find that all 10 fingers uh, show fine uh, individuation and control or shape. Uh, we can uh, decode grasp, again, which we knew from monkey research. Uh, it's bilateral for the hands, uh, again, uh, it's something we knew uh, as a potential advantage that came from monkey research. Uh, what we didn't know is that a single implant can uh, decode intent of effectors essentially uh, spanning the entire body. Uh, so that was uh, quite a surprise. Uh, we did experiments in collaboration with uh, Yuli Rudishauser on uh, decisions made about whether you've seen something before. Uh, so it has uh, operations in decision making and uh, also in indicating confidence. Uh, I'll cover this, but uh, also a action semantics uh, and not talk about this, but also mathematics. So, uh, so the question was, how, how is this possible? How can uh, one small implant uh, carry so much information? And we kind of had a hint uh, from early work I did when I first uh, started as a uh, junior professor at the Salk Institute. And across the road were, uh, was when 
uh, neural networks were being developed, uh, back propagation was being discovered and uh, using uh, hidden layers. And uh, so uh, with one of the group, uh, David Zipser, uh, we published, uh, since I, we were getting a non-intuitive result about space. Uh, at the time, uh, people recorded from visual cortex, of course, and things were related to the retina. But to, uh, uh, to perform actions in space, you have to convert that signal, since your eye is always moving, uh, to locations that are, uh, say, with respect to the hand, to make a hand movement to a target. And so we're wondering um, how, how this conversion would take place. And we thought we'd find, when we went in posterior parietal cortex, which is an area uh, from humans, when they get lesions there, they have uh, spatial deficits. Uh, we thought that we'd find uh, maps that were invariant to eye or head movements that would code locations in space or locations with respect uh, for limb movements uh, to the hand. Uh, instead, what we found was the cells remained retinotopic, so when the monkey uh, shifted his eye, the retinotopic field moved with the eye, uh, but it was sensitive also or mixed in the, the position of the eye. So uh, you can see from looking up and to the right to down and to the left, Stimulating the same location on the retina uh, produced the gain effect. So the, the cell is integrating both eye position and visual signals. And we found uh, using neural networks that they developed in the hidden layers, mapping from uh, retinal space to uh, uh, space outside the body, that uh, you could use very few hidden units in this particular uh, application 36 units, but you could even go uh, much less, and represent all of space. And the way uh, this works is that uh, rather than being concerned with a cursive dimensionality and cells each being tuned to an individual variable, that you actually mix these variables. And then you can go in and uh, decode uh, from that mixture. Now this is uh, reemerged as a... Um, popular concept in uh, recent years in monkey work uh, and uh, also computationally. So FUSI at Columbia uh, uh, has uh, from uh, work from Earl Miller's lab and there uh, also been uh, work from Churchland and others uh, that they're finding again a, a mixture of different signals on single neurons. and. So the uh, idea of FUSI is that, uh, again, uh, cells, instead of coding one thing, uh, code more than one. So you can imagine uh, three cells here. You have three different states, and each cell responds to the state, by, but by a different amount. So if you want to classify, uh, you can uh, use the linear uh, classifier to uh, distinguish all three of these states. And so this is the way that you could pack a lot of information into just a few neurons. And so uh, looking, uh, now we're back in human uh, posterior parietal cortex. Uh, we're having the subject imagine making a hand movement or attempting to make a hand movement uh, or to speak. And in this case, it's left and right, so it can be to imagine a, uh, a left hand movement or imagine right hand movement, for instance. So here's a neuron uh, that responds for imagine or attempted right movement. Uh, here's a neuron that only responds to imagined movements, but either of the left or right hand. Uh, here's a cell that only uh, responds to attempted left hand movement. And here's one uh, that responds uh, when hearing right but not uh, left. So clearly, uh, we see that there is this mixed coding within uh, the posterior parietal cortex. So we decided to uh, test this uh, a little more um, rigorously uh, by using a uh, effector uh, that would be hand or shoulder. Uh, in this case, uh, the subjects can move their shoulder, uh, at least Nancy. Uh, the body side left and right, and the strategy, which is imagine or attempt. 
So uh, in these trials, uh, so there are uh, eight uh, possibilities or eight different conditions. The subject first um, uh, in a trial interval, then there's the uh, written text of what to do, a delay, and then a go signal uh, for the subject to uh, perform the action that they're instructed. And what we see is that we can, from the population, uh, decode uh, all eight of these behaviors. Uh, but again, they're all mixed in, within the group of neurons. And if we look at the uh, correlations, uh, we find that there actually are structures. So in this case, for strategy, that would be attempt or imagine. Uh, if it, sa it says that the cell uh, has attempt, uh, it will also uh, more than likely code imagine. And the same is true for side, for left and right. If it's coding left attempted hand movement, it's more likely to also record, uh, have right attempted movement. But it's segregated by a body part. So in that case, if you have shoulder, you're at chance as to whether it will also uh, have the hand. So uh, this was uh, from a, a preview that uh, Hans Scher Scherberger wrote to our paper. Uh, so instead of having a purely mixed uh, representation where you uh, have everything going in and then a output read out, uh, what we see is that uh, there's uh, subspaces in which uh, that are divided by effectors. So you have a vector uh, sitting uh, in one area, uh, which includes site and strategy, and another effector in a more separated area. Now, uh, potential advantages for this is if you learn something with your left hand, you can easily transfer it to your right hand. Uh, advantages for uh, segregation uh, is, of course, the dynamics and biomechanics of those parts of the body are different. So. Uh, this may make sense for this kind of uh, segregation. So uh, another uh, aspect we've explored is bidirectional. So we'd like to make the robotic hands, uh, you can reach to something uh, under visual guidance pretty easily, but then if you want to manipulate it, uh, you find you can't do that. And that's because you're not getting somatosensory information back. So the idea here is to uh, decode the signals and then in the robot limb have it sensorized so it can then feed back the signals into the uh, uh, somatosensory cortex to uh, sort of close the loop to provide uh, somatosensory feedback for improving the movement control. Uh, so here's a subject um, FG that uh, was implanted uh, about two years ago and uh, implants were made in ventral premotor cortex, uh, 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 poster, uh, inferior uh, uh, posterior parietal cortex, because we we're looking at another uh, grasp area down there, and uh, two uh, recording arrays of 48 electrodes each were stimulating within primary somatosensory cortex. And so this is the uh, task that uh, FG does. Uh, you'll see that there'll be an intertrial interval. Uh, then uh, the purple light will indicate a uh, stimulation of one second on one of the arrays. And you'll see uh, the array stimulated light, light up here. Um, then <clears throat> and there'll be three different arrays. Uh, and then a, a Again, a gray spot where he then uh, reports where he felt the sensation, what it is, and uh, how intense it was. Yeah. W13, short, and forward, by one. Yeah. Eight, seven, 
15, with a short uh, tap by two. So uh, what we have uh, found with this, uh, first uh, there's a somatotopy, so there is uh, individual regions of the anterior and posterior part of the uh, contralateral limb that, in which he felt sensations, uh, included the uh, forearm and uh, upper limb as well as some in the hand. Uh, what was uh, extremely interesting was that uh, he actually reported natural sensations. And we uh, just asked him to, in a short word or two, describe what he's feeling. Um, uh, didn't bias him in any way. And uh, he reported a number of uh, uh, what appeared to be both uh, cutaneous and also proprioceptive uh, sensations. And uh, we asked him, you know, uh, do you know what tingling is after the study? Uh, uh, he said, yeah, that'd be like grabbing an electric uh, wa uh, fence. So he understood those sensations, but he was reporting uh, what appeared to be natural sensations. So in conclusion then, uh, monkey research has shown intended action signals in the posterior parietal cortex uh, based on the monkey research, a neural prosthetic for people with paralysis using an, uh, posterior parietal intention activity has been developed. Uh, very large numbers of variables can be decoded uh, in posterior parietal cortex due to this partially mixed representation. And uh, the partially mixed representation uh, indicates suggests that movements of much of the body uh, can be decoded from single implants, which is really an advantage uh, for neural prosthetic uh, operations. And finally, stimulation can uh, feed back somatosensory signals for bidirectional brain-machine interfaces. So this uh, is really quite a fa family affair. Uh, you get to know the families, the subjects, uh, and uh, it's a great experience. Uh, members of the lab, particularly data I showed today, uh, Tyson F. Plalo, Spencer Kalis, Vasilios Christopoulos, Michelle Armenta, Luke Bradford. Uh, also, uh, it requires, by definition, multidisciplinary research. So uh, we work with uh, UCLA, USC, and uh, different rehab centers. Thank you.